Elvis Presley thought he was a country singer. He appeared on the Grand Old Opry, they called him the Hillbilly Cat, and the B-side of his first record was Bill Monroe's Blue Moon of Kentucky. But this wasn't country, this was rock and roll. All the radio stations wanted to program for this new group of consumers called teenagers. And so they all stampeded in the wake of Elvis to this new format, rock and roll. At that time, a lot of kids were listening to country music, and Elvis came along and they just, they left the building. So there were nights when the Grand Ole Opry uh, at the Ryman Auditorium was only a third full. Rock and roll was music for teenagers with a teenage take on life. It was fast, sexy, and urban. Country music with its cowboy hats and shiny suits suddenly looked very square indeed. Nashville fought back by developing something called the Nashville Sound. And that sweetened country music. It made it more palatable to pop listeners. They put background vocalists on it, like the Anita Kerr singers and the Jordanaires. They downplayed the banjo and downplayed the steel guitar and brought in strings. And they kept the heart in the country song and the heart in the country singer, but they put them in a, on a little cushion of sound. And the great beneficiaries of that were Skeeter Davis and Patsy Cline. Crazy. I'm crazy for feeling so lonely. I am crazy. Crazy for feeling so blue. The Nashville sound of Patsy Cline's records was lush and dramatic. The beginnings of country politan, the crossover pop where country's high lonesome got the metropolitan treatment. That's the beauty of those songs. I mean, she picked those songs because they moved her, and uh, and yeah, she would, she would cry, and she had a tempestuous personal life with her husband, and. It all hit her right there, you know, and it come, you can hear it in the music. I'm crazy for trying and crazy for crying and I'm crazy for loving you. Patsy Cline had shifted the focus on from Kitty Wells and her honky-tonk nightlife and into the suburban home. Women had found their voice and the era of the female country music icon had begun. I'm and I'm crazy for As the 1960s unfolded, prosperity, urbanization, and even the pill gave women more independence than ever before. Into this changing world came Loretta Lynn, the coal miner's daughter, with the songs that made sense of the times. You thought that I'd be waiting up when you came home last night. You'd been out with all the boys and you're in the half tight. A liquor and love that just don't mix either ball or me behind. Loretta Lynn had married at 13 and had four children by the time she was 18. Like her audience, she had made the journey from the backwoods to the town looking to change her life. She became a country music legend. She wrote about who she was and about who her women in her audience were. She was telling it like the women lived it. The rise in the divorce rate at the end of the 60s was the clearest sign that the old rural notions of morality were changing. Women were on the move, making their own decisions. Tammy Wynette, like so many others, came in from the cotton fields to taste this new freedom, only to find a different kind of trouble. I've watched Mommy and Daddy hang if that's the way 
Tammy Winnett's life and music was so close it was hard to tell them apart. Her songs were confessional, drawn from real experience, which echoed the lives of millions of other women. My daddy said goodbye. I think she was not scared or afraid to sing about anything that was important to her, which meant as a single mom or as getting remarried, you know, all these things that were happening in her life that maybe back in the 60s and 70s weren't always the thing to, to talk about or to sing about. Our little boy is four years old. I'm quite a little man. So we spell out the words we don't want him to understand. Like T O Y or maybe S U R P R I S T. The audience for country music were no longer living in fear of crop failures, floods and hurricanes. Many of them had moved to the suburbs. There were still disasters, but of a different kind. She had an ability to convey emotion um, so greatly within her songs. You know, you really believed she was the mother of the little boy and she's spelling out the songs to shield them from the knowledge that the parents are getting divorced, you know. This was not a put on or a character. This was, could be her real experience. She was the first person in our whole family who had ever been divorced. Singing the song D-I-V-O-R-C-E was an expression of, look, this is a painful thing. There's a you know, there's children involved, there's you know, a man and a woman who love each other, but it's, it's not working out. And there's people all over the world who go through this every day, and, and they relate to the same pain that she did, that she felt. Oh, I wish that we could stop this D-I-V-O-R-C-E. The thin line between Tammy's art and her life was apparent when she married the country singer George Jones in 1969. Their duet albums appeared to track the real life ups and downs of their marriage at a time when the whole idea of family life in suburbia was under fire. Tammy had come to represent the typical long suffering married woman and now it was George Jones turn to represent the men. Their music was the soap opera which told the story of their audience as they also struggled to hold on. George and Tammy actually lived out their entire relationship in their duets. They had the ceremony, which was about getting married, Golden Ring, which is about getting divorced. I mean, everything in those duets was sort of playing out in real, in real time while they were married. So that, was, that added an extra sort of vibrancy to them, I think, too. They are the number one husband and wife team in country music. George Jones and Tammy <laughs> had real strife with one another and real feeling and love for one another too. But beyond that, they were artists and they were making show again of, you know, their feelings and using their abilities to stand in for the broken-hearted man and the broken-hearted woman or the woman wronged and the man who wronged her and are able to put that in a song and on a record. It's a really amazing feat. We're gone. Sadly, they couldn't hold on. George and Tammy got a D-I-V-O-R-C-E in 1975, sending George back to his honky tonkin lifestyle of alcohol and cocaine. The bars are all hung. It's four in the morning. I must have shut them all down by the shore. 
that I made I lay my head on the wheel That old horn begins honking The whole neighborhood knows Jones is home drunk his generation had aspired to be freewheeling cowboys, but the truth was they were riding lawnmowers instead of horses, and the honky tonk angel was now the ex wife. He stopped loving her. Bobby Braddock wrote the song which confirmed the George Jones image as the country singer crying in his beer, taking self pity and turning it into tragic high art. Loving her. At the time, I wasn't in that good a shape to record yet, and I was still trying to get my life straightened out. So when I started uh, getting my life straightened out, that's when I went in. And uh, But it stayed on my mind every day. Every day I was trying to sing the song. And I said, well, that's got to be something to it. I thought it was just the song. You know, until I heard George's version of it, I didn't realize how good it was. He stopped loving her today. They placed the roof upon his door. Soon they'll carry him away. But he stopped loving her today. It's the full experience of life because life is always bittersweet. So when you get a pop song that's just about happiness and fun, it's a lie because nobody's ever 100% happy. We're all ticking time bombs and none of us get out of here alive. But that doesn't mean life isn't beautiful and full of moments of incredible joy. So George Jones, he could sing about it that way. He can make you feel like life is huge and full of great, joyful moments, but it's always tragic. And soon they'll carry He stopped loving her today. Country music had survived the earthquake that was rock and roll by relocating from the country to the town, and that town was Nashville. And a huge industry had been built on songs which addressed the adult themes of life's disappointments, but many people thought the music was losing touch with its roots. Enter the man in black, Johnny Cash. Hey, get a rhythm. When you get the blues, come on, get a rhythm. When you get the blues. If anyone in country music still believed in the self-sufficient cowboy as the ultimate American hero, it was Johnny Cash. He was a preacher with a message of hope and redemption, and he wrapped himself in Bible black. Pretty early on, he realized he really looked good in a black suit. He started saying that he you know, was going to wear his black as kind of a symbol of, of protest against the wrongs in the world. Again, another person who was very, very influenced as a child from the Western movies and another huge Gene Autry fan. And even though he loved that kind of fancy look that Gene Autry wore, he knew for himself, a great big tall guy, um, big broad-shouldered man, that the black was a better look for him. Johnny Cash had found the right costume. And to make his message clear, he also stripped his music of any unnecessary adornment. There was no steel guitar, no fiddle, and no banjo. Just three chords and the truth. Cash used Luther Perkins on guitar, and he was a guy of limited technical ability, uh, to the point that it would frustrate Cash sometimes. But Cash's producer at Sun Records, Sam Phillips, loved it. He would take Luther's guitar away after a recording session so that he could not practice. He wanted him to be able to go da 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 Because you're mine, I walk the line. And it's got that raw, lean rhythm. It's a guitar and an acoustic and an upright bass and snare drum. I mean, there's nothing on the record, and that's what makes it intense. Uh, 